So first I'd like to start with you two, the team behind this incredible film that we just watched. I'd like to you know, talk about how this idea came about and why you felt it was important to make this film together. And I'm curious how you landed on animation for this topic instead of live action. I'm gonna have Ryan go first. All right, pressure's on. So first of all, thank you all so much for coming out. It's a packed house, which is incredible. Also, the screening was absolutely beautiful. Uh, Vishvaji and I have toured around with this film all over the country uh, since it premiered here in New York at Tribeca in June. And this is definitely one of our, our favorite screenings we've had. It's absolutely beautiful, so thank you so much. Um, Vishvaji, funny enough, um, was the sixth, this is the sixth film I've made about six and sick issues um, in film school. I went to Chapman and there was a strong connection with the Sick Lens program and they um, work with film students to make films about sick and sick issues. So I've been to Punjab, as, as you mentioned. And my very last um, project, my very last student project, I was randomly assigned actually um, to do a live action documentary about Vishwaji and his work as Sick Captain America. So we came out to New York. Um, and it was unlike any experience I've ever had up to that point, um, seeing Vishwaji get up in his Sick Captain America outfit and go to the streets of New York. And usually topics like racism and intolerance are, are topics that are very difficult to talk about, especially with strangers, especially on camera. Um, but somehow Vishwaji, through this persona and through his personality, um, allowed people to open up about their biases on camera and talk to him very openly. Um, and ever since that moment, um, actually there was one moment in particular that I always have to mention while shooting that live action documentary is, we had a beautiful day, like I mentioned, Vishwaji interviewing people on the streets of New York. We never had to ask anybody to be on camera. There was always just a line of people waiting to talk to Sick Captain America. Who is this guy? I want to talk with him. Um, but as soon as he changed back into his civilian clothes at a Starbucks, he, he came out and someone yelled Osama bin Laden at him uh, from across the street right in front of us. And um, it's one thing to, to hear about that happening, and then it's another thing to see it happen, and especially to see it happen in such contrast to all the positivity we had seen all day. Um, so ever since that moment, I kind of realized that there's something special about Vishwajit, something special about his story, something special about his work, and uh, I've just had an urge to, to make a deeper film about his whole life story. So in 2019, I reached out to him again and uh, said, hey, we've never done animation before and we've never made a, a proper film about your life, how about we do it? And luckily, I'm honored that, that he agreed. Yeah, so we have spent a good four years of our life uh, on mostly on phone. I visited LA um, and I joke about this, but it's not really a joke. I mean, he probably knows me better than most people, barring my wife, my family members, my parents. Um, you know, I, it's a lot of, if you love this film, and I, a lot of credit goes to this guy because he is an amazing storyteller and he sort of poured, he literally like was asking me every question you can fathom in, uh, in one's life. And of course the process of, you're seeing the 30th cut of this film. So we actually did extensive user testing on this film. And I know you mentioned this, uh, Rena. Um, we did animation because there's two major tragedies in the film, 1984, that I survived with my family in 9-11, and we very quickly decided live action is going to be very hard. It's going to be emotionally very uh, gut-wrenching for audience to connect with the film, so we chose animation. Um, but we user-tested it with a lot of Ryan's friends and family, because this film is really for an American or even extension global audience, right? We are like, we're not trying to tell... And I like to say this, I'm, I, usually this comes at the end of um, these conversations, but I'm gonna just say this. This is an American film that happens to have a sick character in his story, right? It's very important, because I don't see myself represented in American media and landscape, right? So I want films and shows that tell and show characters who look like me without it being, okay, let's explain who you are. You know, let, you're somebody who's not from here, so we gotta define you or confine you. That is not our goal. We want to make films that are just happen to be an amazing American films, and they just happen to have sick characters. And this film obviously covers such a broad range of topics as we have been talking about. You know, it's identity, it's religion, it's discrimination. As you said, Ryan, it's not 
easy to talk about these things, but you guys manage to put all of that in a film that's less than 10 minutes, right? So I can imagine, given that it's about your life, that some things had to be left out, some things could stay, some things had to go. How did you decide on, on making that work? Well, so money is definitely one thing that decides. So <laughs> animation, as you can imagine, is very expensive. So we knew every minute can co cost thousands of dollars. So we're like, okay, we have this much time, um, lots of back and forth. We knew certain things are going to go in, certain things are not going to go in. So I'll give you an example here. You see that transition of me cutting my hair, leaving sort of my, my background, my heritage. Ten years passed between that transition to me donning the tournament before 9-11. There's a lot that happened in there. And if that hadn't happened, I would not be here to this. For example, I fell in love with books, and through books, I fell in love with Buddhism. And I practiced Buddhism and Taoism for a few months and years, and it's through that entry into spirituality that, that, that I come into the faith that I have today. So unfortunately, we could not put that in. It's just you only have so much time. And so that's a huge part of my life. That's not in the film, and of course, the other parts as well. But me and Ryan had to uh, figure out, okay, we got to keep this as a very powerful story. It has to, has to have good transition points, and which is true even for feature-length films. You have to leave a lot of things out. But yeah, it was a tough... For most part, me and Ryan are pretty chill. We, we, keep our, we keep our anxiety inside. We don't freak out on the outside. We, had, we slept on our disagreements. Which did you think about it for a couple of days? A lot of back and forth. We worked out really well. I think that if, if, we, had, if we had different dispositions, things might have been a little different. <laughs> Uh, Vishwajit have, and I have always been on the same page in terms of, you know, wanting to make the very best, most compelling film we could make for any audience, um, because we kind of felt a lot of pressure. I mean, our, our goal was lofty, but we wanted to make, you know, the most successful film ever to feature the story of an American sick. Um, and this was the first time that a film with a sick lead character has ever premiered at a major American festival. Um, so I feel like we've, we've been successful and I also want to mention that we've just been hugely honored by the amount of support that we've gotten um, fundraising for this film. We've had 600 people donate to the project across two different crowdfunding campaigns um, and the support and excitement for the film keeps coming and, and now we have incredible executive producers on our team um, who are just really pushing this film forward so it's an exciting time. And speaking of executive producers, I'd love to bring you in, Vikas. Just talking to you, our recent conversations, I can just hear it in your voice that you are just so passionate about this film and that is so cool to hear. And I'm curious what your journey has been in getting involved with this film and why you felt it was important to be a part of this. Oh, wow. You know, this was really one of the best screenings. I've seen the movie 100 times. I was born during a war of India and Pakistan, 1971. I lived through the genocide of 84. I was one of the first people who entered Golden Temple post Operation Blue Star. Even today, I have such bad traumas when I smell, and by God's grace or disgrace, I have a crazy nose smell because being in the kitchen all my life, I still have so much of trauma of burning hair because I saw that happen in Amritsar. All my friends were distant from me, my two best friends who are Sikhs. I've lived through that. Then I go to uh, Bombay in 1992 riots of Babri Masjid. I was given shelter by a Muslim woman to protect me. I've seen how those scars have shaped me. The displacement of uh, Kashmiri Hindus coming to Amritsar, the pundits, I saw the pain what it brought to them. 9-11, I saw the trauma of how the discrimination broke me totally in, inside out. The reason I made Holy Kitchens was actually to express my love for Sikh community because I learned how to cook from Sikhs. I saw that for me, when the article came out first time about Ryan and uh, Vishwajit, no, that I'm not about you, it was just about him. Sorry to include you. <laughs> but I, it broke my heart seeing the online hate against the saying that people said that a Captain America cannot have a turban and a beard. But my grandmom who raised me always told me that Sikhs are superheroes. She said they are our protectors. 
They are the ones who will first stand up if there's an earthquake, calamity, and look at the institutions. They are the sons of Guru Nanak Dev Ji. And this is what she taught me all my life, and I believe that wholeheartedly. And for me to see a superhero in real life, for me, I was like fighting with people on Twitter, and I think that this is a superhero. You guys don't understand. These are the, these are the children of Guru Nanak Dev Ji. They have the basic foundation of a religion is seva, which means supporting each other. So for me to come on this, with this movie, it was completely natural to see somebody with so much of compassion, hating, who was fighting hate with this compassion and love, and both of you collaborating on this, I would jump into fire for this. And for me, my dream is that to see a Sikh guy wearing turban and beard walking up to the Oscar stage. It might be one of the happiest and one of the most emotional days of my life. To see that happen and to see the support, it's a step forward. I see that. And you've done a lot of work um, to help the Sikh community. I'd love to hear you talk about that. And I also just want to talk about something you said yesterday on the phone that I actually wrote down. It's just the reporter and me, but I just loved uh, what you said here. I think it poignantly summarizes just one of the themes of this film and of this night. You said discrimination happens when people don't understand the culture or the people that they are discriminating against. So if you could just elaborate on that and talk about your work in the Sikh community. So I remember, now let's go back to 2010, now how life comes in full circle. I've been a part of Asia Society's leaders that since I think almost two decades. And right on this platform, on this stage, in 2010, my documentary Holy Kitchens was launched. There were so many people who were even from the White House, from Ivy League colleges, which invited me to go to the colleges and speak about Sikhism through Langar, the community kitchens. And for me, I was not at all a public speaker. I was just a chef from stainless steel kitchens. And I would be wondering why am I being invited to Oxford to seek, speak about Sikhism? And in Oxford, they told me that the reason of this hate is non-understanding. It's ignorance towards this. It's non-understanding not to be friends with them because our inbuilt fears with the media, with the persona, we projected. Ryan said that if this was the first film with the main Sikh character in Tribeca Film Festival's history, imagine what happens on 97th Oscars when we are going to get nominated. God is watching. And this conversation is obviously relevant at any point in history, but we are obviously living in a very charged time, right? There's a lot of polarization, there's a lot of division, but it's stories like these that create understanding you know, amongst a larger audience. And I'm curious what you guys hope the takeaway is from this film. I mean, the, the very end uh, card um, this film is dedicated to every American who's ever felt unwelcome or unwanted. That was in a very early version of the film. Um, and kind of the whole point of Vishwajit's work is I think anybody can relate to, to feeling not fully accepted, not fully understood. Um, and like you said, and I, and I agree with that statement, that a lot of the hate that we see in the world today is, is from um, ignorance, non-understanding, um, and, you know, if more people could stand up and do work like Vishwajit's doing, um, teaching the community in a way that is, that is hopeful and full of heart, um, I think we would be in a much better place. Yeah, and I'll just add, you know, I do a lot of work. So I became a public speaker, again, by accident. 9-11, became a cartoonist. Then the Captain America thing starts. And I started getting a lot of invitations from companies and schools um, to come and share my story. So I, I do storytelling. I tell my story through cartoons and photographs. And what I find amazing is uh, I usually go and ask strangers. I tell my host, do not introduce me, and I ask these little kids, what comes to mind? Where do you think I'm from? And it's very stereotypical responses. You know, they, they put me outside of the U.S. Uh, and then I share my story and I ask that question again. You know, what words come to mind? And it, those words change radically, right? They know a little bit about my story. And what I find amazing, even with this film, is I've had people come up to me who come from very different backgrounds and they're like, you know what, Vishwajit, I connected to that part of the film or I connected to that part of the film. For me, that is the power of storytelling. You know, you tell the story and it's, you know, true authenticity, vulnerability, and you're going to have people, no matter what their backgrounds are, they're going to find connections to different spots. So that's my hope and mission as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, as a human being is 
we need to we need to talk about our real selves, including our biases as well. And I tell little kids, look, I, I grew up with um, the most predominant bias that I've learned from American and South Asian culture, the two cultures I've grew up in, is an anti-blackness. And it's, you know, it's, we, we're struggling right now to talk about anti-blackness in the US because we don't talk about these things. We don't know, we're not trained in our schools, in our homes to talk about this. But I, I talk about this with kids and, and that I'm a work in progress, that I'm trying to be a little less, right? It's, it takes a lifetime. So I feel genuine, authentic storytelling works. And that's, you know, my hope isn't with this film is that people see, hey, you know what? He might look different, uh, but he's got a lot in common with me. Vikas, any closing words before we open it up to the audience? I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> what do you hope people take away from this film? I think they already took it. They already took it. This is going to be in the minds that next time they see a Sikh, this image is in the mind. And you know, compassion and understanding is most important. You know, whenever we talked about great chefs, we only saw white Caucasian chefs. You know, there was not even a single Michelin star Indian chef when we started our journey. And we were always told that you're not enough. When we worked in our own country back home in India and we worked here, you're not enough. And that is why I feel these stories, that's the reason I always come out and support these stories, because when people feel that somebody's not enough by how their appearances, their accents, their countries of origin, their skin color, I feel everyone was made more than enough. And for me, that's a takeaway, that Vishwajit is more than enough. Love that. And with that, we will open it up to any questions. We have a mic that's going to be passed around. Thanks so much. Wonderful film. Really, congratulations, and thank you for sharing it with us. Um, when you started this film, my guess is you probably couldn't have predicted that the second candidate of the Republican primary would be an American Sikh with a different trajectory than yours. What's your, comparing and contrasting your experience with that of Nikki Haley, what do you think are the lessons about America and acceptance? Well, so I'll start, you know, America is a very diverse place. And I think you, you mentioned Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley comes from a Sikh tradition as well. She embraced Christianity at some point. You know, Indian Americans, South Asians are a very diverse group. And I think that's the biggest highlight that I want people to see when you see Nikki Haley, myself, and many others. We have a lot of embedded diversities within us. So certainly I shared certain parts of my heritage with her. But I think it just goes to show we human beings are incredibly diverse. Um, and, you know, is every Sikh out there, you know, has same you know, political uh, ideologies? Absolutely not. So I just think what the, your question highlights the fact that we as human beings are incredibly diverse. We might look similar, we might have names that are coming from the same part of the world, but we're just incredibly diverse. So I think that's, that's how I would respond to your question that we just were, we're we are, uh, another way to, uh, to respond to your question is I have met people who do not seem to share a lot with my heritage. They are, Americans, some of them are police officers, and I've had connections with them. And I feel sometimes they have more in common with me than a lot of folks who are sitting in this room because of our journeys, things we like, struggles we've had. So yeah, it's just, you know, we're, we're all unique, but at the same time, we also have a lot in common as well. So congratulations, that's a great crisp movie, I'll have to say. Um, so much came across in such a short span of time. I mean, the cartooning is uh, fantastic. The, the use of colors is beautiful. Um, what I found very fascinating is that, you know, uh, India is the birthplace of Sikhism. That's where it came about. And you were able to show that, uh, you know, as an aftermath of the 1984 riots uh, or, or the happening that happened there, um, you know, the Sikhs were brutalized there immediately after the 1984 event, right? Indira Gandhi dies and then this happens. And then we see the same thing here, so many seven seas across, 
um, 9-11 happens and the, you know, another group then begins to uh, brutalize. So I think what you very powerfully were able to show is that this hatred is something so fickle and it is something which can just come about uh, and yet it can also go away. So I think the fact that it just, uh, it just comes about uh, because people were in anger, because people did not have enough information, they didn't have, they lost the empathy and the passion that we're all talking about. And uh, uh, so it just spurred, like, you know, so these two different geographies and the same kind of hatred uh, goes to show that hatred is universal, but so is compassion and what prevails after that. And I think that's what I really liked about your uh, film, that, you know, you felt empowered finally in America, this is you, this is Captain America Seek, right? So um, I don't know if there's a question for you, but if you wanted to add on to it, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Hi, um, thank you for the film. Um, I think the, the format is just incredible and it you know brings out so many different elements. My question is, um, when you think of a Sikh Captain America, um, is there a way to take it forward in terms of what the superhero might be, you know, doing, or you know, how does one then see it going forward from here? Yeah, me and Ryan talk about this. Uh, we're already kind of working on our pitches for full feature-length films, streaming platform shows. We have. <laughs> um, so Captain America is copyrighted by Disney and Marvel, uh, unless they want to approach me and say, hey, we want to do a show with you, Vishwajit. <laughs> I'm totally open. If somebody has connections, you know, let them know. Uh, but I think also, you know, we feel like, I mean, it's as great as to have Superman than Batman than Captain America. You know, we need, like, new superheroes, like, that are created from scratch by creators, hopefully, who look like me and folks sitting here. Uh, yeah, we're ready to tell more stories that actually have superhero elements. It doesn't have to be somebody who wears a uniform, but somebody, you know, who exudes superhero qualities. Looks like a lot of us sitting in this room. So, yeah, that's kind of our goal with the future projects. Right, Ryan? Yeah, something that Vishwajit is, is determined to do in, in a future project and something that I'm excited about, too, is, is to, um, you know, tell more stories that have sick lead characters, um, but the story themselves like doesn't have to be featuring a sick lead, if that makes sense. It could be any um, American, for example, that just happened to be someone with the turban and beard, and I think um, when you see that more commonly in film, uh, you'll, you'll have true uh, representation. Thank you for this incredible film. Um, I believe that it will uh, prevent violence and lead to a lot of healing. Um, so thank you for the courage that it takes to make a piece like this. Um, in, in watching it, um, I couldn't help but observe within myself a kind of conflict and tension, and that being um, a desire to be for people to understand who we are as a people, um, as individuals, but also a desire to not have to explain oneself. Um, you know, we all carry a lot, and I... Personally, I'm at a place where I no longer explain myself and I want people to level up. Um, so I don't want to do the work, I want others to do the work. So how do you, what advice would you have? How do we balance you know, this tension between um, an obligation for society and humanity to level up, to understand who their neighbors are, versus um, you know, what might be kind of um, in our own necessity on some level to kind of explain who we are? That's a great question. That's a deep question. I'll say this, and I've, you know, I've reflected on it a lot. Um, there's many different things we can do. Um, I do a lot of work with kids, and I really feel we certainly need to do introductions to different faiths and traditions in schools. That helps. But I think what's even more powerful is having stories of people, Americans from all different backgrounds, and telling those stories. And so kids are learning about fellow Americans through stories. Um, and so New York City actually has a project right now called Hidden Voices, and they've started a few years ago. So they have Hidden Voices projects for African Americans, Hispanic Americans. So this year in September, they released a series of stories that they're using in middle and high school. And it's a story of 
a lot of different Americans, and I've been honored to also be a part of that storytelling as well. And what I find is one of the most important tools we have is creating a space where we can tell stories. So of course, you know, filmmaking is one medium, but I really feel, I feel the frust frustration you have. Um, I don't want to have to tell people every time, you know, I'm not this, or this is who I am. And I think one of the most powerful tools we can use is storytelling. And that, there's many different mediums, but filmmaking being one of them. And we need to, I know the space is expanding for stories to be told that represent um, many people who are sitting in this room, but we have a lot of work to be done. Um, it's not like, you know, uh, Hollywood is like, yeah, let's tell six stories. Uh, let's tell indigenous stories, right? There, there's, the door is beginning to open a little bit, but there's a lot more work to be done. So I would say we collectively support artists, support storytellers. Um, that's one way, you know, we can make a difference and, and tell your stories, you know, through different mediums you have. Be vulnerable. I mean, that's the biggest advice I can give you is be a little vulnerable. You might, you might get people, you know, harassing you a little bit, but I think you'll also make very deep connections with people who hopefully will thank you and say, you know what, thank you for being very honest. Because I think we're living in a time right now where it's very easy to just stereotype, typecast, label people. And I think what we need today more than ever is people who are vulnerable with their own insecurities and also their courage as well. Um, I know that animation over the time has changed a lot, so I was just wondering a bit about the animation process and how that worked. I'm going to let Ryan answer that question. <laughs> yeah, so um, we, uh, as Vishwajit mentioned, we went through 30 different versions of this film um, just using audio and storyboards. So we kind of had the whole film totally planned out by the time we got to the stage of bringing it to different animation studios. Um, we reached out to about 20 different animation studios and uh, one in particular that got back to us um, with a, a quote that was the only one that even remotely affordable um, and also just like a, a very large excitement for the project happened to be a studio in Australia, um, Studio Show Off, and they were incredible to work with. So actually the first time um, the whole crew got to meet together uh, was our Tribeca premiere because, you know, Vishwajit's in New York, I'm in Los Angeles, and then our whole studio is in uh, Australia. And one thing I like to mention sometimes in Q&As that's kind of fun um, is uh, the Australians had never even been to the U.S. before. So talk about a diverse team. And uh, there's even some errors in the film that we never asked them to change because I thought they were funny. Um, one of the main ones I like to point out is that the outlet and the 9-11 scene that the TV's plugged into is an Australian outlet. Um, and then Central Park looks totally strange and different. Um, but for Vishwaji and I, as long as they got the turban correctly drawn and the beard correctly drawn, that was the really important thing. Because um, it's the first time that you know any of us have ever seen that animated before. and We want it to be perfect. Um, but uh, to answer your question, there's a lot of hand drawing and there's a lot of computer animation. They use software called Toon Boom, um, and Vishwajit and I just had weekly meetings with them, looking at the progress and giving notes and making sure everything was um, coming together. There were 15 animators who worked on this film. Half of them were women animators, so Studio Show Off tries at level best to have women animators. And you know, there was one thing I'll, I'll mention. So one of the animators mentioned this to us when we met in Tribeca. He goes, or actually maybe it was before actually on a Zoom call. He goes, I have, while working on this film, he suddenly started seeing Six in Melbourne, Australia. Not because suddenly Six moved to Melbourne, Australia. <laughs> they were always living there. His brain started seeing them. And you know, that is, you know, I say this because that's why it's so important to tell stories that represent the entire American global fabric. Because there's a lot of us even today who are not seen, right? So even small short films can make such a big difference for people behind the scenes and of course people who are seeing the film you know, in the audience like you. Great question. Thank you, it's a great film. I have two questions. 
first of all, definitely your approach is very unique and I really appreciate that. But as a person, when the 9-11 thing happened, uh, did you personally felt angry at the Islamic community that because of that you have to face again another tragedy? And when you felt that, um, definitely, you know, I see the compassion, the way you say the story, how you dealt with it. That's my first question. And the second question is, if today, given a chance, other than Captain America, who is your favorite Marvel hero and who will you like to choose the second? I'm sorry, I had a little bit of a hard time hearing you, so let me. Oh, how did I deal with discrimination post 9-11? So I'll say, you know, it shows the tension issues between women and men. <laughs> Or journalists. Thank, thank you, thank you, Vikas. Um, <laughs> my wife will agree with you. Uh, um, you know, the initial few weeks was very hard because the first two weeks after 9-11, I was living in Connecticut and working in Westchester County. I did not leave my home for two weeks. And when I did leave my home, people out on the streets on highways made an effort while driving at 55, 60 miles an hour to flip me off, to roll down their windows. And this is almost people representing the entire American fabric, men and women, black, Hispanic, white. Everybody was so vulnerable, angry, ignorant, that they took the liberty to tell me, go back home, Osama bin Laden. It was hard. Um, it went on for months and years. I've been called Osama bin Laden. I've lost count. And I know there are people sitting in this audience who've gone through similar experiences and worse. Phys Luckily, I've never been physically assaulted, but I know people who have been. Um, I know six who've been arrested in the aftermath of 9-11. It was very hard, but somewhere deep in my head, I sort of had this understanding there's a lot of ignorance out there. I'm not going to judge these people. And part of that comes from my faith, um, that we have the potential to be the most horrible human being on this planet, and we also have the potential for being the most beautiful human being on this planet. It's a spectrum, right? So... That sort of guided me, and then of course, you know, I always met some interesting, good people who checked up on me. Like, I would have strangers come up and say, are you okay? And that was enough, right? So, I will say, you know, this, we're living through very difficult times. We have a lot of asylum seekers in the city. We have a lot of differences. It helps sometimes if you see somebody, you get a sense somebody's in trouble, they're lonely, just go and ask them, how are you doing? That can make, uh, there's a woman in my, this is again not in the film, and me and Ryan actually struggled to put this in our not, and we decided not to put this, this person in, and I'll just take a few seconds to tell the story. When I came back to the U.S., I was in a very dark space. I had survived a genocide. I was bullied as a kid a lot, uh, loving parents, but I was in the, in the U.S. by myself. And so one day in Orange County, I'm on a bus, and I'm really down. And I could sense somebody staring at me and behind me, so I look back, and there's a woman uh, looks like my grandma with a million wrinkles on her face and she is holding a strawberry and she's offering it to me. And I knew she knew that I was in trouble. And I call her Hope because we never, no words were spoken. I did, I did not take her strawberry, not because I didn't want to, but just somehow I said, no, thank you. But her image is in my head, even today. And that gives me hope. So I would just say, look, people do a lot of mean things. Don't develop a thick skin. Don't take it personally. And you never know what's going on in their lives. When people are vulnerable, what do human beings do? They take it out on other people, sometimes their loved ones. And every one of us has sometimes done that. So, um, you know, that's, so that's the response to your first question. The second one is about Captain America. Is, do I, so I will say this for the record, and I know people have, you know, Casts happen when I say this. I was not a fan of Captain America before this whole Captain America thing happened. Um, I accidentally discovered Captain America and sketched a superhero, Captain America, with a turban and beard, and somebody had to spend a year convincing me to don this uniform. Why did I want to put on this uniform? Because I'm like, I already stand out. People already tell me to go back home all the time. Why would I want to wear a skin-tight skin leotard <laughs> to get even more attention on me, right? So, um, so now my affection with Captain America is, it's a story. A Jewish American created Captain America in 1941. 
Most Americans don't know this. Most American superheroes were created by Jewish Americans, immigrants. Um, there's a connection to the Holocaust behind a lot of superheroes. But it's the power of that story. We all know it's not real, but somehow we respond to Vishwaji dressed up as Captain America differently because I'm wearing that. There's a story there, right? Um, so long-winded way to say I love Captain America, but more than ever, the lesson to be learned is you can tell stories to bring people together or you can tell stories to tear people apart. And we have examples of those right now happening across the globe, and we certainly, history is full of great examples of horrible stories to keep us divided, race being one of them, one of the greatest, and I mean that in a bad way, one of the most powerful, impactful, horrible, incredible story ever told is a story of race, of black and white people, because technically there's no black and white people, right? But we, we have this story and you and I cannot unlive that story because our entire culture is founded on that story. But that's how powerful stories are. And it might take another 500, 500 years for us to undo that story, but that's why it's so important to tell stories. <laughs> Sorry, I can, I tend to give long winded answers, so I'm. Hello, I'm sorry, and what is the role of prayer and meditation in the Sikh tradition? Um, prayer and meditation is very central to the Sikh faith, like many other faiths. Um, I grew up in a, very, uh, in a family that was not religious. My introduction to the Sikh faith happened through storytelling first, and then when I fell in love with Buddhism, again through meditation, and then Taoism through meditation. I came into the Sikh faith through what we call kirtan. It's hymns, poetic verses set to music. So sound and music is very important in the Sikh faith, and which I believe is impo actually important in many different faiths, Judaism, Islam, Christianity. Uh, poetry and music is so critical. And so I fell in love with the Sikh faith for the first time in my late 20s through music. And that is how I started my journey. It took me two years to uh, grow my hair long. Uh, and interestingly, I donned the turban for the first time a month before 9-11 happened. And the only reason, and perhaps one of the main reasons I did not give up my turban, you know, um, uh, in the aftermath of 9-11 is because I had made that spiritual, meditative, musical connection to this tradition. Um, I just want to say that what I took from the film, and I'm a filmmaker myself, I'm developing some Sikh stories too like you, um, is our quest to be identified and be accepted in society or wherever we are, in any culture. <clears throat> Sikhs were, you know, somebody said that the Sikhs originated from India, they really came from the Punjab, and that's where the religion was born. And that entire important region of India went to Pakistan. So the Sikhs were displaced, and many of them went to Canada and other countries, US and so on. But I think every human being wants to be, ha wants to um, have an identity and be accepted no matter which culture they move to. And I think that is our quest. I'm, I'm also born in the Punjab, and I don't feel 100% American, but I think we Punjabis do have a little talent of assimilating and getting accepted and you know, doing what we have to do in another culture. So what is your thinking about assimilating, finding your identity? Because you did achieve assimilation, but kept your own identity. So that's a huge thing for me, to be able to be who you are and yet be able to live where you ever you are in perfect harmony. Yeah, I think you know it's taken me a very long time to be comfortable in my skin, uh, and I know um, a lot of kids today, and even in you know the last many years, I still get calls from parents who tell me their kids are getting harassed in schools, which breaks my heart. I think one of the strongest things we can tell our kids is, look, we are all imperfect. We have vulnerabilities. We have strengths. We all have multiple identities that can change over time. We get to choose that, you know, what we are, because 
I think when, if I were to talk to my younger self, I would just say, look, it doesn't matter what people think of you, but it's very hard. I mean, it's when you're a kid and when te- kids tell you off and adults tell you off, go back home, you're not one of us. It's so hard to sort of tell yourself, no, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell my story. I'm going to, uh, you know, have my own path. But I would say, you know, I, I agree. I think I would not use maybe the word assimilation, but I would say, you know, you get to define who you are. And, 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 and reminding yourself and others, it's not one bucket you put yourself in. There's many labels. Like even right now, you know, if you were to ask me which you, you are, I struggle defining myself using labels because I'm a New Yorker, I'm an American, I'm sick, I'm a male. I'm a straight guy, I'm a storyteller, I can go on and on and on. And some of those labels I did not have a few years ago. And I have a feeling in a few years time, I will not have some of those labels still, right? So we have to create a space where we should allow people to, okay, you know, you get to be who you are, but by the way, we are struggling today, right? There are certain groups that we don't wanna accept them, right? Or at least certain segments in America are struggling because, you know, we have something called normal. And I've been told many times by people, you know, you're not normal. You don't fit that medium. And so I think the onus is on all of us to create a space in our homes and our workspaces to allow people to be who they are. Uh, And that means sometimes you have to acknowledge yourself, I have biases too. That's taken me a long time to realize, almost 40 years of my life where I could publicly stand on a stage and say, you know what, I have biases. I have judged people. That is, I think, I, I like to say this, and this sounds harsh. What we have, I know people say this, you know, we have love and affection in common, and, you know, that's what we, that's true. I genuinely feel what we really have also in common is our ability to be biased and judge people every day. And I know it's uncomfortable to hear that, but if we can start, ha- if we can start having conversations by saying, you know what? I'm going to tell, talk about my biases and prejudices. Hopefully, you open that space. And very soon, you know, the connections you will make with human beings when you talk about your vulnerability and, vulnerabilities and biases are much stronger than when you talk about, I love every human being. Because I, you know, I, you know I'm just freedom loving. I don't know. I don't buy that. Because we all have biases and prejudices. So that's my, it's taken me a very long time to learn that. Uh, but I, I just feel we can just make so many good connections if we're honest with each other. And you know, then the, the identity part just kind of rolls with it. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I will share with you, this will trip out a lot of you, and some of you have seen my talks. My birth certificate says I'm white. Because in this story, in this weird story of black and whiteness, for the longest time, and technically in that story, all South Asians are actually considered Caucasian and white. So a lot of South Asians who were born in the 60s and 70s in the US, it says white. And it just, yeah, people chuckle when I say this, but it just highlights the point that we have stories we tell that get embedded, and sometimes those stories allow some people to be more comfortable telling, you know, being themselves, and then some people, they're not as comfortable. Uh, I'll, I'll just say there's two communities. Well, one community that I feel is probably the most marginalized community. We rarely talk about them, and that's the indigenous people of this land. <clears throat> They've been here for the longest time, and we rarely see their stories. We rarely talk about them. And, and myself included. So one of the things we should do as filmmakers, storytellers, is we got to figure out ways of you know, bringing their stories forward. Thank you for that question. Hi, Vishwajit. Um, thanks for, yeah, hello. Uh, thanks for standing out, Vikas. Thanks for standing out and being an inspiration for the community. Thanks to all of you for making this movie. My question is around the growth of the movie and the message. Maybe the question is more to Vikas, but are there any plans for uh, translations, globalization of the message, and then maybe like collaborations with other people making, let's say, toon, uh, cartoon shows for kids, as you mentioned, message to the kids is very important. Uh, any plans you can share or any thoughts around that? You know, throughout my career, I've always figured out if one person breaks the code, it motivates the entire community. 
the one person who is going to open this door as we are sitting here on the stage you will be surprised at how much influence this brings in the next few weeks if you know god is watching us and listening to us you will be surprised at how these things worked you know it i also understand being the first in so many things i did in this country the moment something i did it opened up the schools from the very grassroots to the kids they started opting for indian cooking they started chasing this whole dream that you know so i just feel that having a seek in the center of the film and having the entire conversation around it that victory is going to be victory of our next generation and also of our ancestors so some days you have to take one big story and one small story and make it big and this is what we are doing with american sake and i feel that if we get shortlisted or nominated you'll be surprised at how many kids will be so proud of this and then you start this whole cycle with this circulation which i feel is absolutely you know i'm going to say that when you said that white or colored you know once one chef asked me are you white and i was like yeah some days when i fall into a bucket of all purpose flour <laughs> i'm not going to let anybody take it seriously about who am i i'm not going to let anybody do that only my mom has the right to judge me nobody else and <laughs> so i do feel that vishwajit's story normalizes this entire conversation of you will see characters coming up who are seeks you will see and trust me if i am getting recorded on this platform to say this this is not just a movement this is a part of our cultural change shift happening in america we were driven by time and this is the time for somebody who has to be proud of their heritage comes out and represents us instead of being coconut of saying that you know i'm just brown on the outside i'm just white inside i just feel wholeheartedly embracing of who you are is what vishwajit has done to me especially and you cannot imagine what this project leads to what we will see the all purpose flour in it <laughs> first of all i just want to thank the team for such a brilliant film and i think the concept of uh, captain america is a great concept and it needs to be pursued further and i agree with uh, you my friend that uh, it, it 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 is so important for the sick dies for everywhere in the world and they are everywhere every corner of the world they are there and you know going back to early 1900 somebody came up with a caricature of character for mouse and that became a mighty mouse and now we have a film studios you know playgrounds disney world and i think the concept that wish has come up with is a brilliant concept and it should be used in a very positive sense to project positivity not only of sikhs but human positivity as a general because i think when you look at history sikh contribution has been immense over the last 200 years but going back to india even further back is incredibly a lot of contribution because 1469 when guru nanak was born there was a lot of oppression going on by the invaders who came into india and Guru Nanak's message was standing up against oppression. He was passing a message of brotherhood and many other positive aspects. But that message was carried on to the next nine gurus, to Guru Gobind Singh. And in fact, this month is a month where a lot of his family were butchered. They were killed. And again, that family stood for oppression. They were fighting against oppression. and i think uh, your character is a brilliant character and i would like to see it succeed as you know all the other characters which have come but you can project your character in many positive way to advance humanity with sikhism attached to it i myself a sikh 
and I address my, I'm, I'm not from America, I'm from Britain. I'm, I'm a British, I usually say I'm a British Indian Sikh born in Kenya living in UK. So that's how I explain myself. <laughs> and it's very important because that gives you the positivity that you need to confront the world because psychologically it's your psychic which promotes you to be able to compete and get on with people. Even if those people are with negative thoughts, it's your thoughts which can convert their thoughts into positivity. And this character, I think, is a brilliant character. It needs to be pursued to the success, yeah, to the Oscars, as we said. <laughs> Thank you very much, and good luck to the team. Thank you, Uncle. So I do want to say, I want to say just a couple of things here. There's two people I want to give a huge credit to and big thanks to. So one is Mark Fury. He's the cartoonist who, a few weeks, a few weeks after the tragedy of 9-11, he created this cartoon, which captured the predicament of a lot of brown people, Hispanics, South Asians, Sikhs. That was a cartoon that gave me the spark to start cartooning and start creating Sikh tunes that I call Sikh tunes with turban and beards. And then the second character, and Uncle, you use the word brilliant, and you know, I, I share some of that credit, but I have to give a huge credit to Fiona Abud, who is a Brazilian Jewish American photographer. She was supposed to come in today, but she had a family emergency. Fiona saw the poster that I'd created after, nine, after 2011 of a Captain America in a turban and beard, and she goes to me, Vishwajit, you should come back next year to New York City Comic Con and dress up as Captain America. And I said no way to her, right? <laughs> she stayed on it for a whole year. She convinced me to don that uniform. We did a photo shoot in June 2013, and that photo shoot went viral, and my life has never been the same. So thanks to, you know, this is where a single photograph, a single cartoon, a single piece of art, film, uh, a single dish can change somebody's life. You never know how something you're doing and creating can just alter somebody's life. So Mark Fury altered my life, Fiona Booth, and there's a few others. So I just want to say, you know, the credit that you're giving me, really, it has to be shared with a lot of people, uh, especially for this film. I'm going to use this uh, metaphor that I use all the time, and we'll finish on this metaphor. Consider us a couple. Um, he's the mom, and I'm the dad. He conceived the baby, <laughs> carried the baby. I was like a dad, yeah, let's do this. I certainly had you know, input, but really, this guy <laughs> is the mommy. Okay, so if you love this film, Feel free to give him a hug. Uh, he's very open to hugs. He says satriyakal and a couple of other Punjabi words. But I really, I really want to, you know, it's, it's an amazing sort of partnership. And really, Vikas and Gunit coming on board, I mean, they're just bringing their amazing passion. And Gunit, by the way, if you all have not sort of read Gunit and Vikas's story, they have just incredibly powerful, vulnerable, up and down stories. And I think in some ways I feel our connection partly happens because we have had some re we've had tragedies in our life, which a lot of people do. So thank you to everybody on this stage. Thank you to the 600 people who gave us anywhere from $10 to $10,000 to make this thing possible. Thank you.